So first, what is observability and why are we talking about it? Um, let's start with a little bit of level setting. So systems have functional requirements, you know, cars, software applications. Uh, functional requirement is specifying what a system is supposed to do, right? So a car, for example, transports people from one location to another. Systems also have non-functional requirements uh, that specify how a system is supposed to be or defining it, in other words, defining its qualities. So comfort uh, or, or safety, uh, specifically for um, this example, uh, this protecting the Hopkins from harm during transport is one of the qualities that you want from a car. And these are just one of the many illities of the modern software and, and engineering uh, applications these days. There's usability, scalability, testability, uh, you know, readability, maintainability, availability, all of these illities. And observability is just now one of these illities, right? And applications, different applications have a different scales for how, how much of that quality um, needs to be present in that application. For example, maybe the blue app needs to have a scalability uh, uh, twice as much of a green app on uh, this example. Werner Vogels, the, the CTO of AWS, actually explained observability really well in one of his uh, keynotes for reInvent in uh, late 2020. So I'll, I'll play his video and kind of let him describe uh, observability. When we talked about the history of dependability, I mentioned systems theory. A related field of that is systems control theory. It has been crucial in building many dependable industrial and other systems. The most important pioneer in this field was Professor Rudolf Kalman. In 1960, he defined concepts such as whether a system was controllable, and observable, or actually inobservable. To be observable is something we know as software engineers all too well. How can you infer the internal state of a system from its outputs? These can be functional outputs like voltage and amperage of the turbines, or non-functional outputs like the turbine temperature sensors, or rotation speed measurements. And this is what we try to achieve with the observability property of a dependable system. How can we infer the internal state of our digital systems from its outputs? Which can include both functional, requires from API calls, for example, or requests to other parts of the system, from non-functional information, that we collect through other means. So inferring the operational state of a system based on its outputs. You've got your inputs and your system, which is opaque, and then you have outputs, which you can see, measure, and analyze. And observability has a quality scale itself, right? So just like uh, scalability, or maintainability, there's on, on one end, it can be, you know, your, your outputs leave the system still completely opaque, you can't see into it. Or on the other hand, you have excellent observability and you your outputs uh, render the system completely transparent. You can see everything that's going on within your application in your system. So to kind of, uh, to illustrate this, we're gonna time travel back to the, to the early uh, 2000s uh, with a very, very simple PHP app. Uh, maybe this PHP app just took an image, uh, extracted uh, URLs or uh, metadata from the image, and um, outputted a, a simple page that allowed you to see those uh, metadata and attributes of that image. Well, if you have 
uh, if you had, you know, things like just server monitoring, your CPU and memory of your application, of the host of where your application was running, and then maybe you added a little bit of the Apache server application logs to see the amount of traffic or the um, request per second and the amount of errors, um, you're actually maybe doing pretty well for this simple, simple PHP app. You know, your observability quality scale might be toward the higher end for something this simple. Why is because, well, this is a very simple, simple application. And early on, you know, 15, 10 years ago, there was mostly identical user experience through the entire application stack. So all of your visitors essentially could be thought of, of you know, the, the, same, uh, the same kind of experience. You know, there's no individual in-application experience that was different from one visitor to another. And if you threw in a little bit of testing across, uh, above and beyond this uh, simple server and maybe Apache log monitoring, you're actually doing pretty well. And you're seeing, you know, a, a very well um, or very, very high coverage of your stack. It's because there were limited pathways to kind of interact with your application. Traditional monitoring is very low dimensional. We treated all of these uh, experiences as the same. You know, we could measure, um, and it lacked the contextual differences that separate the one app experience from another. And now let's talk about why monitoring is not observability, uh, again, with uh, Werner Vogels, the CTO of AWS. Classical monitoring deals with two questions. What is broken? And why is it broken? Monitoring uses a predefined set of metrics and logs to determine known values. In general, with monitoring and alarming, you can't predict when things will fail. You can only take action when they do. It is why we used to call people who monitor these systems operators and not engineers. The generators here at Sugar City are extremely complex. It is very likely that the operator of the dashboard knew how to repair it when something went wrong. But they did know when the sound alarm and gauges moved to where they weren't supposed to go. As systems continue to increase in complexity, it is impossible to put every important metric for that system on a single dashboard that the user watches. Think about everything that goes into a modern application. There are metrics for the service, containers, and functions that you're managing. Your application has counters and logs for all the work it's doing. You may have anywhere from thousands to millions of customers, all which have data about what they're doing and how they're interacting with your application. It is impossible to put all of this on a dashboard that the human watches to define alerts for each of these metrics to tell you when they're going out of spec. At Amazon, we've been on a 25-year journey to improve the processes of managing our systems. And we've long left the notion that just monitoring was sufficient to manage our systems. We've embarked on a holistic approach to operations, from collecting massive amounts of data, and logs, to how we analyze them, to how we solve and talk about problems when we do have. And this is what observability is all about. How can we make sure we have the data, the tools, and the mechanisms to quickly resolve problems in a fundamental way? How can we, without reaching into the system, infer its internal state from the data that we have? And Amazon, our most important drivers have always been customer-centric. Find and resolve problems before they impact customers. Understand the impact on your customers when you couldn't prevent it. And fix the problem so that it never happens again. So he made a, a really important point uh, here is, you know, monitoring is not observability. And with the most complex apps these days or with the, the applications these days growing more and more complex, more uh, services, interoperability, more uh, individual user 
uh, unique interactions with an application, you can no longer fit your monitoring um, and the, the amount of data that you need for observability on dashboards. Systems evolve from simple to complex. This is true for applications today. It's also true for, you know, a telephone. Uh, think about the 1900s candlestick telephone, right? Um, it had different requirements and, and different um, complexities than, say, uh, the modern smartphone of the 2020s, right? Different usability, scalability, all of the illities were different through these generations of telephone uh, evolution. It's true for automobiles and for software. Uh, you know, you can't imagine these, these software, Facebook or Google Calendar or Twitter uh, existing today as they were, you know, 15, 10, uh, even less years ago, uh, you know, with the amount of features and interactivity and infinite stroke scrolling, um, AI applied to uh, feeds, all of these different things that make these applications just more and more complex. And complexity, like entropy, just increases, right? It's true for phones, true for applications. So monitoring is actually now, you know, a subset of observability. In that modern or in that uh, early candlestick telephone, uh, with your traditional, say, basic monitoring of that system, you might actually have been doing pretty well with your, you know, observability um, uh, as, as we talked about it today, of uh, what it encompasses to make sure that you can observe all of the performance qualities of that system. But that's just not true today, not true of uh, the smartphones um, and not true for, for applications with traditional monitoring. For Again, using the example of the PHP app from the early uh, 2000s, you know, with our uh, server, CPU, memory, and then Apache logs, it might have been pretty excellent back then. Uh, those, those limited amount of metrics and um, uh, throughput metrics and server metrics don't cover your observability needs for a modern application today. So, Everybody visiting your PHP app, you know, 15, 10 years ago, um, never really was the same user experience, but it was often a reasonable approximation. Now, it's just not reasonable at all. Modern apps are just much richer, offer a wider variety of user experiences. It's, it's different for essentially everybody using uh, applications these days. Once you log in or start interacting on a personal account on these modern applications, there are so many different ways that the application can behave or respond or execute different things and call various uh, APIs or external services that are just totally unique uh, for each individual's uh, situation within these modern applications. And so monitoring really is the tip of the observability iceberg, right? Traditional monitoring uh, is uh, low dimensional and low cardinality. Uh, things like aggregated metrics or summary statistics are the things that we used for monitoring uh, up until recently. Um, and that sits just on a huge iceberg uh, of contextual data, high dimensional, high cardinality data that you need in order to achieve true observability. For example, Here's a request latency histogram uh, showing two, two peaks, one around the uh, one second mark and then another around the, say, seven or eight second mark. So, so two peaks along this, and you, you kind of get that distribution uh, of this uh, aggregated metric for the request latency histogram. Well, if you add some contextual data to that and you attach these tags for this metric so that we can break it out, and get extra dimensions based on whether it's a desktop or mobile or whether the location is uh, in a certain city. If you attach that uh, geographical and um, platform information, now you can break this out and start to see what the composition of that overall chart was. 
And we can see that if we actually go down through the desktop and then down lower to the bottom charts of the lowest metrics, we can see that that second, uh, that second peak actually matches the New York City and Boston and DC area uh, for desktop users. So we know that that's likely the uh, problem area for this latency histogram on the higher end. The good thing is, you know, with, with um, modern monitoring, we are starting to bubble these up, right? We're starting to bubble a little bit of this contextual data up so it can be a bit more, um, give you a bit more automatic insights into kind of what those metrics may be meaning. That's just a few dimensions. So, um, you know, people have been kind of taking the approach of, well, we can handle that. We can just add this contextual data to our to our metrics, and um, we'll we'll just make more dashboards. Put those more on more dashboards, and let's just add more monitoring for these dimensions, right? And that's just more that's just more monitoring. That's just more dashboards, right? You're going to have a problem of you're going to have just more and more dashboards growing uh, as you add more context, and it's just. As Werner said, it's, it's impossible to observe your systems using the monitoring metrics and uh, dashboards that we've used up to this point. So how do we achieve the excellent side of observability, making our systems and um, applications as tra transparent as possible? When you read about observability or the traditional pillars of uh, monitoring, you'll read about uh, metrics, traces, and logs. Uh, we like to think of them as uh, these, these four um, different um, constituent elements of observability, which we, we define as logs, metrics, spans, and events. Logs are your traditional logs, uh, but they include the attributes and context identifiers attached to those logs as well, so you can correlate the logs, um, these highly specific debugging tools in your logs to the metrics, spans, and events that happen elsewhere. Uh, metrics are your aggregated summary statistics that we're used to in traditional monitoring, um, but including the attributes and context identifiers, again, these are the things that are going to sew and thread the logs and metrics and spans and events all together to kind of compose your observability system. Uh, spans are, are time span tag locations within services or code or your stack to allow you to know at what point in time you were or the request was uh, when that specific uh, period of time happened. And then uh, events are the, the discrete individual events at a point in time uh, that, that were encountered within a time span, again, with just as many attributes and context identifiers as we can attach to these. Um, the kind of analogy here is these constituent elements of logs, metrics, spans, and events aren't necessarily um, super interesting by themselves or useful by themselves. Um, but together, they compose the um, uh, elements and molecules and eventually the planets and universe uh, that exist. So uh, these are the constituent elements of observability. And the context and attributes are the key to observability. So an extremely simplified example of what observability may be within the context of application performance tracing. So let's say a user triggers an action on the front end of your application. Uh, you'll start a, uh, a trace or a span here that's automatically generated from your observability instrumentation. And you can attach these identifiers, this contextual um, information to this trace so that we can identify maybe the front end uh, version or the page route that this, that this user took. Even the, the user metadata, like their ID or their, the product plan that they're on, which device they're using, the location, are they in Chicago, are they in Boston, are they in DC, where, where are they located? And that front end call then makes the, the back end call on your uh, servers hosted on your, your infrastructure, and you can attach back end metadata to that. So uh, which endpoint was hit? which host it was, which container ID, which uh, Kubernetes cluster, things like that. 
and that backend API call makes the database call, right? And then we can create a metrics off of that. We can maybe say, okay, we want to count how many times this database uh, call was actually made and service that as a summary statistic later on. And then that database query is eventually executed on, on the, uh, the database, uh, over the database connection, and we can tell when the, the connection was actually established and make that a point in time event. If that database query returns, we can then log that as uh, with specific database call information. Um, we could log different uh, different information about that database call depending on the time it took and things like this. So now we've made um, a metric, a counter metric, an event, and a log. And maybe we make an external service call. This could be a, a, a API call between your microservices within your individual uh, infrastructure, or it could be, you know, a third-party hosted um, uh, API call from any of the increasingly uh, SaaS or um, third-party vendor hosted service that makes the uh, API endpoints exposed for uh, services that are critical for your application to, to execute. So that external service execution returns, we can log that as well. We've made the response and we send that back to the back end and that goes back to the front end. But maybe the front end, front end action is not completely done yet and it needs to make another back end call, right? So we've still got that top level front end action with the identifier, the action identifier that is actually attached to all of these other calls, the first back end API call, the, the next database call, the database query, the external services. And in addition, now we're making a second backend call page, maybe to load uh, a paginated um, list of, of data on your application. And again, we make a database query. We, we record the connection established there, and that returns the uh, amount of um, items, and we make a count uh, metric out of that as well. And then maybe it, it loads, uh, preloads maybe the second page of uh, paginated results. And we can thread all of this through and connect all of these different uh, events back to that single triggered front end action. So very highly contextual <coughs> and correlated, now distributed tracing in, in, this, in this instance. And then we can log the action outcome metadata on that as well. So you can see that context connects everything. And the, the more context and the more data we can attach to these events and these uh, traces, these logs and these metrics, allows us to correlate all of this information together and allows us to search and uh, surface insights about all of these related events. <clears throat> and until recently, you could do this to an extent. You could buy it from a vendor, a large vendor, typically, and or you could try to build it yourself and a lot of it from scratch. And it was expensive either way. So there's two th there's two key trends changing that. Uh, the first one is cost effective and performant data storage and compute resources for high cardinality big data. The second one is open source observability APIs and SDKs and tooling implemented collectively, collectively with broad support from the community and vendors. So we'll talk about the second one first. Open Telemetry is a fairly new project that's been getting a ton of uh, vendor support and community support and is emerging as a new lingua franca of, of, of observability. Open Telemetry defines a cross-language specification for how uh, APIs and the SDKs responsible for collecting and configuring um, the uh, telemetry and instrumentation of languages and frameworks and libraries should be done. Uh, it allows the uh, standards to be applied uh, in a standard fashion across all of the major languages that then have their own libraries written to adhere to these specs, the API and SDK libraries are written in the native language of these uh, um, programming languages that um, implement the specification the same way so that we have cross-functional, uh, cross-language APIs and SDKs that all handle the data in a standard way. 
And then there's the open telemetry collection and agnostic export formats that allow these languages in the APIs and SDKs to send that data to a collector and further send that data on to multiple backends, whether it be uh, your, your own destination, uh, your open source tools, uh, Zipkin or Jaeger, uh, and additionally to third parties like Scout. So Scout application performance observability, uh, as we're evolving into, uh, is built on uh, open telemetry. And some facts about open telemetry, the top active cloud, it's the now the top active cloud uh, native computing federation project behind only Kubernetes. It's backed by over 130 companies, including the big ones like AWS, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Splunk, and Scout. It's integrated directly into open source projects and cloud native stacks instead of injected into them. And it's simple to use with extensive ability to customize instrumentation specific to your environment. And so that's great, right? So now that there's this vendor agnostic and kind of standard um, way to apply this uh, telemetry and using these APIs that are that are defined through the open telemetry specification and available for uh, open source libraries and packages and framework maintainers, um, there used to be this wall in, in between the observability instrumentation like Scout would, would uh, write itself and apply as an outside-in patch to these libraries and frameworks in order to gather telemetry data. Um, we're kind of breaking down that wall and the, the package maintainers, they would have never, we could have never approached a package maintainer like Rails and say, hey Rails, we want to put um, Scout APM's observability instrumentation into the Rails framework and commit it to upstream to the Rails project. There's no way that they would have applied that vendor specific uh, telemetry into the Rails project. But now, uh, breaking down this kind of wall in between those with the vendor agnostic uh, APIs and uh, uh, specifications, it's now more acceptable and uh, more libraries and packages and frameworks should be more um, willing to incorporate this open telemetry uh, into their libraries and frameworks. So that's built natively into these libraries and frameworks instead of injected by vendors uh, after the fact. So let's talk a little bit about the components of open telemetry. There's the specification, which defines um, kind of how things should be laid out. It makes the standards of what we're talking about and naming and operations. And then there's the API, uh, which is the application program interface that uh, library maintainers and framework maintainers will use. And then there's SDKs, which are um, meant to be used by the end user or within your end application um, in order to configure and use uh, open telemetry within your application. And then there's also the collector, which is a way, uh, a means of collecting this, this uh, data sent from these SDKs uh, to the collector uh, as kind of a, a proxy of either further uh, aggregation or processing of this open telemetry data and sending it to the backends. Uh, the collector, though, is, is optional. So the specification. The specification actually defines how the APIs should behave. It defines the standard naming, uh, the stability guarantees, the separations of concern, the communication protocols and the data formats and the compatibility, uh, the backwards compatibility uh, guarantees that it, that it makes for the API and the SDK, et cetera. Semantic conventions are just the way that we name things. This could be things like um, container ID or uh, uh, cloud region. Like what do we call the, the key value pieces of these where we can find that contextual information in a standard way uh, that we can connect all of the logs, metrics, traces, um, and uh, our logs, metrics, spans, and events uh, together to kind of weave them into um, an observability picture sliced and diced through any, any possible combination that we want to investigate. And then OTLP is a uh, transport it's called the Open Telemetry Line Protocol. It's a transport protocol that defines how the communication between the SDK and the uh, collector should behave. 
The API component of the Open Telemetry uh, project is um, the purpose is to develop an API library in every major language to be used by library and framework developers in order to add instrumentation natively into the library or framework. The library authors won't care if, if end users are open, open, using open telemetry or not. They can implement the API and collect um, or put the hooks in to collect the uh, telemetry information using the API. Um, and if an end user is not actually collecting the open telemetry data from this library or framework, it will not have any overhead and they won't need to distribute a instrumented version of their library or framework in a non-instrumented version of the library or framework. It's just completely transparent whether you're using or not using uh, or not collecting the open telemetry data from this library or framework. And it's zero overhead if the user does not enable open telemetry uh, in their application. And it provides very strict stability guarantees. So the library authors and framework authors, they won't need to be concerned about, well, is this API going to be changing? Is it going to break things? Um, it provides a very, very stable and strict guarantee to these library and framework authors to kind of ease their concerns about affecting their uh, library or framework. The, SDA, the SDK piece was in, intentionally um, decoupled from the API piece, so there are separate packages on every single language, and the purpose is to make sure that the API is super stable and the SDK can evolve and um, change in a, a quicker fashion as needed uh, where it's user-facing interfaces. So um, every major, major language, is, this is intended to be used by the end users in your applications that then serve your users, right? And you can enable the open telemetry data collection using the SDK um, and, and start consuming the open telemetry data emitted from any of the uh, libraries that you use. You use the SDK to set configuration options for what gets collected, what processing is applied after the collection, and where the metrics are sent. Um, and I ju just discussed that it's intentionally decoupled from the API for stability guarantees and dependency flexibility. And all languages with an open telemetry SDK can send data via OTLP natively. So that's an important part. Um, if you're using open telemetry within your application and you set the SDK up to gather this open telemetry data, you don't need the collector piece, uh, the separate collector binary piece um, of open telemetry in order to send this data somewhere. So that makes this collector portion of open telemetry optional. But the Open Telemetry Collector is an application written in Go that receives Open Telemetry data from end user applications, and it can use pluggable modules to further process the payloads, such as making um, metric generation, doing aggregations, uh, applying transforms, or rate limiting, and et cetera. And it sends the data, again, it can send it upstream to another collector, or it can send the data to uh, for further processing um, or to data stores to SaaS providers like Scout. So where does that leave Scout uh, with the observability piece in mind and what's our roadmap for 2022? So the Scout product roadmap for 2022 is uh, transforming from application performance monitoring to application performance observability and eventually into full stack observability. In Q4 of 2021, we released the uh, external services uh, feature of Scout that allows you to understand and monitor requests to external services um, through HTTP API calls to third parties or to the other microservices that starts to get that um, a bit of that observability piece as far as the external services go within the existing Scout platform. Last year, we actually started building a new platform specifically geared towards being able to do the application performance observability um, uh, utilizing open telemetry in 2022. So we're expanding from application performance manage monitoring to application performance observability, being able to ingest high, um, just gigantic amounts of, of traces, trace data from applications in order to provide that observability uh, piece with all of that contextual information 
um, gathered from open telemetry instrumentation and allow you to see insights into your application uh, based on that data. And then later this year, we're going to move beyond application performance observability into full stack observability. Things like uh, logging and events will be able to hook up and gather this open telemetry data in from further um, systems, and not just applications, but um, systems and infrastructure that emits open telemetry metrics, logs, and even traces outside of, tr of the um, traditionally APM uh, applications that we've so far um, focused on. And then Observably 1.0, by the end of this year, um, we uh, have a very aggressive timeline of becoming out of, out of beta uh, by the end of this year. So open telemetry, how it's changing data collection in Scout. Um, so right now, the open telemetry or the Scout agent sits in your application, and it's an in-process thread that collects telemetry data from the instrumentation that we've written ourselves. Um, it collects metrics for every single transaction uh, and sends that to Scout. And then it, in addition to those uh, aggregated metrics, it picks out interesting traces, detailed traces that are selected from an algorithm that um, give you some insight, uh, the startings, the, the beginning of, of some observability within your application to what may be slow or where the pain points of your users may be. But the, the difference between um, the way the Scout agent works now and the shift to open telemetry is now with open telemetry, the open telemetry instrumentation will sit within your application and traces of every single transaction will be sent to Scout. And Scout's uh, value add and what we need to surface for, for application performance observability lies in what, what insights and what we can automatically provide to your developers or to your performance um, um, uh, engineers about your applications without overloading you uh, or requiring you to build any dashboards to get those insights, right? So that's going to be the challenge of observability in the face of just enormous amounts of data collection. So just like the uh, Hubble telescope uh, change the observability of our universe. Open telemetry is a very large piece of how we can enable observability within our applications and infrastructure over the next few years. Uh, what may be a dark spot, a blind spot in your application performance now will change with the uh, addition of open telemetry. So just like the Hubble telescope, zooming into a, the darkest spot that we could find from our observable galaxy, uh, we can now see that it's not dark, it's not empty, it's actually full of these whole galaxies that are now observable, invisible, um, that we thought and or never knew that were there before. And we can observe these with the modern instrumentation. Uh, so this is what observability or what open telemetry is bringing to the open, um, the observability space and the monitoring space. So open telemetry uh, is a somewhat new project uh, over the last two years. And the tracing portion of open telemetry is actually stable and being released as stable uh, within the major languages now, uh, JavaScript, uh, Ruby, Java, Go, those languages are, have, have or are approaching stable releases for the API, SDK, uh, and the protocol. Open telemetry's uh, timeline for metrics and logging follow um, within this, this year and early next. Uh, they're working on sta stabilizing Actually, the protocol and API for metrics is already stable. Uh, the SDKs and feature freeze, and now you're starting to see development being worked towards uh, and on within these languages for the API and the SDK for metrics. And then after that will come logging 
so that the whole of the open telemetry uh, project encompasses these, uh, these three traditional pillars of uh, observability. And our development um, follows the open telemetry um, timeline very closely. We're not trying to build a vendor implementation on top of the open telemetry uh, project. We're not trying to put any shins in between us and the open telemetry. We don't want to, we want to be part of the open telemetry um, ecosystem and the uh, contributors to open telemetry uh, so that's available for everybody. And it's not, uh, again, going from the uh, walled garden of traditional APM vendors or um, logging vendors into an open standard and then eventually, you know, five or so years from now, uh, migrates its way back to being walled, uh, walled garden type thing. We want to uh, this is, this open telemetry project is super, super important um, and it is changing the game of uh, monitoring and observability, logging all these larger vendors. So we want to keep it that way. So what does this mean? If you're a, a, a current Scout customer, um, it means the choice is yours. Um, you can remain on the existing Scout APM product, and we will continue to support and improve our uh, existing Scout platform in 2022 and beyond. Uh, you can choose to go hybrid. Uh, you can have your existing applications remain on Scout APM and put any new applications that you hook up to Scout on the observability platform. Or you can, you can mix and match uh, your use cases as desired. Um, the great thing is you can run both the existing Scout agent and the open telemetry uh, instrumentation side by side. Uh, so you can, you can run both at the same time and you can time it to happen when you want. It can be incremental to switch over as our new platform becomes more mature uh, and adds features um, for, for things that you're already getting in the Scout platform. So uh, in conclusion, kind of the observability is coming soon to a theater near you. If you want to learn more about observability within Scout, um, uh, sign up for our newsletter. It's scoutapm.com slash observability, and you can stay informed, uh, opt into the beta of the new platform, um, and just stay up to date with uh, Scout's evolution into application performance observability, and eventually full stack observability uh, through this newsletter.